Thank you all for coming out tonight. Um, it is a, uh, it's a great pleasure to introduce our extraordinary two speakers today. Um, Daniel Pink, I, I think probably many of you know, um, his, um, uh, he's written a, a number of extraordinary books. Uh, Drive, I'll start with, uh, profoundly impacted my approach to business and just how I think about human psychology. And I was actually just talking with a, a friend of a friend who said the same thing, that it was perhaps the book that had most influenced his approach to both business and understanding his own behavior. So if you haven't read Drive, you should go out there and read it. And I think it's not an accident that Dan's TED talk on the subject is I think like the seventh most watched TED talk ever. Um, he also went on to, uh, to write um, a series of other books, including um, the, his latest is, is When on the Scientific uh, 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 Principles of uh, Perfect Timing, which caused me to, I had, two months ago I had a colonoscopy scheduled. I called up and I canceled it. It was scheduled for the afternoon and I rescheduled it for the morning. I'm, I'm not gonna go into all the rest of the things you can learn from when, but I will also say you should definitely go. If you, if you plan to ever get surgery in the balance of your life, definitely go out and buy when and read when. Um, and Dan's other, other books. Um, I think Dan may consider his greatest achievement to be, and this is tongue in cheek, his participation in the Next Big Idea Club. Uh, which, um, as, as some of you may know, um, we, the Next Big Idea Club is, is, I think we live in a time, Dan and I were talking about it earlier, when there's a lot of, non, let's say, non-essential information, discouraging information, a lot of malarkey, a lot of, a lot of kind of like noise out there. And I think it's a time, there's a, a zeitgeisty feeling about it's a time when I think we, a lot of us want to focus on things that really matter. There's a flight to quality and a flight to meaning. And the Next Big Idea Club is really born out of that, that we've got uh, Dan Pink, um, Susan Cain, Adam Grant, uh, and um, uh, <coughs> Malcolm Gladwell, thank you. How can we forget Malcolm Gladwell of all these people? Um, selecting for you the eight most groundbreaking, life-changing books of the year. We distill them down to 20 minutes of extraordinary video, audio, text. We send you the books if you're, if you're a box subscriber. Uh, and so we have a bunch of wonderful subscribers. The next big idea club here. Some come in from Boston and other places. Uh, and we have, we're live streaming to 8,000 Next Big Idea Club subscribers and other people on Facebook. Um, and uh, so thank you all for being here tonight. Now, um, Safi is, um, Safi Bacall is an extraordinary person. I had the great pleasure of speaking with his mother earlier this morning, if, uh, or this evening. Uh, if you are the son of uh, a legendary astrophysicist and a legendary theoretical physicist, what do you do? Well, I think you obviously go to Stanford and get a PhD in physics uh, and, and go into a life of academia. And then you say, well, maybe I need to do something different. And then you go to McKinsey and advise companies. And then you start a, a pharmaceutical company to try to cure the world of cancer, grow that into an extraordinary phenomenon. And then you write a book about the intersection of physics, history, and business, and what we can learn. Uh, and, and it has, uh, I'm a huge fan of Loon Shots. Um, for, uh, I, I think you're all gonna really enjoy the conversation tonight. Uh, so with no further ado, Dan Pink and Safi Bacall. It's, can you guys all hear me in the back of the cheap seats? Yeah, so it's, uh, so it's great to be here. Uh, thank you for, for all of you who have supported the Next Big Idea Club. Just to echo what Rufus said, uh, we, we do have this world where you feel like uh, the culture has coarsened, where people don't have conversations, they just scream at each other, um, where people aren't actually concerned about ideas, but they're concerned merely about confirming their own existing biases. And in some ways, in many ways, Next Big Idea Club is, is just an, a direct, I think very potent antidote to that. And I think it's one reason why it's grown so fast. So it's really, uh, it's a delight to be part of it. And the w main reason it's a delight to be part of it is that you get an early look at some extraordinary books, including the book we're gonna talk about tonight. It is called Loon Shots, written by this guy. Now, I always think it's interesting to start with people's backstory because, um, so, so Rufus gave us a hint, Safi, but what, where did you grow up? 
I grew up in Princeton, New Jersey. Princeton, the mean streets of Princeton, New Jersey. Yes. The right. gang, it was a very rough gang. Yeah. So you, so, and, and, the, and you're the, tell us about your mother and your father, and, and if you can, like, what's it like growing up with two parents who are physicists? I recognize that your mother is here, so be polite. Right. I, you know, I should just stop by saying that every now and then when I get these kind of glorifying introductions, I say, gosh, I wish my mother was in the audience. <laughs> you are. Yeah. I hope you believe even 10% of that stuff. So, um, also, I actually should say, it may be the first time I've ever been introduced preceded by a story on colonoscopy, so thanks. <laughs> thanks for that, Rufus. Planting that visual which will no longer extend to both of us. What was it like growing up? Um, well, wait, you know, seriously, I'm, this is a serious question, because like, like, like you came to write this book at, how old were you when you wrote this book? 12, 13? Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. I, in my uh, late 40s. Yeah, so you, came, so you have a whole history of your life until you got there, so let's, let's, I want to hear a little bit about it. So what were you like as a kid? What were you What were you interested in? No, I think, uh, you know, it sounds uh, dramatic and, and glorious to have two astrophysicist parents, but, you know, a lot of the time it's like, well, what's for dinner? Is it pizza or Hoagie Haven or, you know, who's going to open, who's going to fix the VCR for those people who remember what that was? Um, but I think what it, it did and the benefit and the excitement of that is we had a family of asking questions. So when you're a scientist, you really focus on asking interesting questions and that that stayed with me my whole life, and that kind of drove a lot of things in my life and changes that I made in my life and how I think about what I want to do next is curiosity. Mm -hmm. And so did you have to come to the dinner table armed with a question? Uh, Mom? <laughs> is that right? No, no, it wasn't like that, but it was just, you see that around you, they're always like, oh, here's something in the world, like when you're- Did you have, I mean, I don't want to turn this into a therapy session, Safi, but I, I want you to be a little bit more forthcoming like here. Did, like, did you have a sense of what your parents did, like when you, were, when you were a kid? Did you know what like physicists did? No, no clue, no. Yeah. But you know, we'd be driving, I'd be driving along with my dad in the, in the, you know, down a street and you'd see this sort of shimmering thing that looks like a lake. You know, if you ever driving on the asphalt, and instead of just ignoring it, he'd be like, well, why do you think that shimmer? Why does it look like a lake? And then we talk about refraction, and that just creates, I'm sure that happened to all of you guys with all of your dads. But that's, no, that's cool, but that's, I think that's interesting, right? But it makes Did you have a pet? No pets. No, I was thinking you probably had a pet like Schrodinger's cat, right? No, no, we didn't have a pet like Schrodinger's cat. That's oh just, God. Is that a physics joke there? No, we kind of, kind of part of that. Right, okay. Um, and, and, but you ended up studying physics in college. I did, and you know, part of that curiosity thing is that you are just, you see stuff in the world, like why is the sky blue? I mean, that's sort of a classic or cliche, but you start looking around. Why is water wet? Why can you stick your finger in and slosh it around? Why does it suddenly change when you lower the temperature? Why? You just start asking why the world is the way that it is, and you just keep going. And so you went even further with physics to get a PhD, and what was the impetus behind that? Just like more questions? Yeah, it's, it's just, you're just teasing, in undergraduate science, you're just learning some of the basics, sort of the basic rules, the basic language. It's sort of like writing. You, you learn some of the basic techniques of writing, but that's very different than producing a book. Sure. So you go to graduate school, you learn, okay, I'm done with all the elementary rules. Right. Now how do we figure out something new about the world? And that, that was it. really exciting. Interesting, interesting. But you chose not to pursue that path. As a, as, a, as a scholar? Yeah, I, you know, I, I don't think I'd set foot off a of university until I was 29 or 30. And then I just started to get really curious because I observed something about the world, and this may shock you, but not all people are physicists or mathematicians. And in fact, a large majority of people are not actually physicists or mathematicians. And I was like, what do they do for a living? I was just very curious, what do people who are not physicists, what, you know, they get up in the morning, yeah. and then what happens? Yeah. And so I just got very curious about that. And I remember I was, you know, dating somebody at the time, and I was like, you have a real job, what is that like? Can you take me to an office building, and can I meet these people? Because I'm not kind of, I don't know what that is. And, you know, I really didn't, and I was yeah. curious. And I, she was uh, actually 
I don't know if I should be talking about this. No, my wife will never watch this. But um, she was uh, working at a law firm as, what is it called, paralegal? So I said, oh, you take me? Okay, sure, I'll take you for, and I went around and asked everybody a little thing. Oh, do you like your job? No. Do you like your job? No, I hate it. I'm like, this just doesn't sound good. <laughs> so I was like, maybe I should stay in physics a little longer. But eventually I got really curious about how the rest of the world works. You know, what is, you know, big companies, small companies, entrepreneurs, that makes the world go around. I was curious, how does that work? So you went from your PhD program into McKinsey, consulting companies. Yeah. How long did you do that? Uh, McKinsey's kind of like a halfway house for academics just before they let them loose in the real world. Yeah. You gotta kind of train yeah. them and let right. them speak English in normal sentences and dress <laughs> properly. So it's sort of like a halfway house where they coach you on kind of business and teach you language and they pay you. I remember when I was in graduate school, yeah. I had... You know what, that's one of the cool things about people who work for a living. I mean, yeah, they get paid. Isn't that yeah. amazing? Like, Extraordinary. When I was a graduate student, if I had $5 for a burrito, I'd be like, oh, this is a win. Right? And then you get to McKinsey, and then like two years later, it's like, where's my clothing? I hit it there at five o'clock. You know, you, you just, unfortunately, you get slightly adapted. But it was amazing that they paid you to learn. And so that's what I really enjoyed. Right. But then you left there and you started a company. Yeah, What's the sure. impetus behind that? Well, in, uh, you know, the motivation in academic science is the search for truth, which is kind of an exciting, ambitious, um, higher purpose. And in McKinsey, it was really a, a learning experience. Your job is to solve business world problems. So it's a halfway house because you're solving puzzles and problems, but your goal is to make successful companies more successful. And over time, I just started realizing what would, was really satisfying for me is if I could give help other people. Around, the time, around that time, my father got sick, and I realized there would be something, we lost my father eventually, and I, I realized there's something enormously powerful if you feel like you are working to give people and families on earth more time with their loved ones. And that that's just such a motivating force and power and such a great reason to get up in the morning and that's what I wanted to do, is combine science and business and help scientists who had ideas that were stuck at universities or in the lab, bring them out of the lab and turn them into products that could help people. Which you did, starting, the com starting a company that specialized in cancer drugs. Yeah, that's right. So we, uh, uh, I spent about a year on the road just sort of talking to different scientists at different universities, and I ran into a scientist who's now emeritus, a professor at Harvard, who had a bunch of terrific ideas, and they were sort of stuck and trapped and I decided to work with him and start this company and we developed a portfolio of products but mostly focused on new drugs for treating cancer. And the company did well, you succeeded in, at least in part in your mission. We, you know, it, it's still going yeah, right. but I, I left a few years ago but um, we took the company public and we had some ups and downs like every biotech company and we'll see, Jerry's still up. Yeah, now, so let's move into, into books. So, how did you prepare yourself for this role of starting a company? Did you read business books? Uh, I did. I was a, when I first started uh, my biotech company, I was in my early 30s. So I read like drinking from a fire hose. I read everything I could find about what it takes to be a great leader, a great manager. And, uh, you know, it was, a, it was kind of frustrating. I, the first five or ten books or articles about, you know, create a great culture and right. do this stuff, you know, you're like, oh yeah, that sounds good. I want people to be empowered. That's awesome. Let's do that. And then the 10th time, you know, empower, and then the 100th time, let's empower people and so right. You're like, is there anything more? This sound, you know, I want something a little harder and more satisfying. So it, it got a little frustrating. After and was, that, was that the germ of this, of your book, Lynn Shots, do you think? That frustration I, with what was out there? I think, uh, I was always looking for something beyond, you know, the, in, in business books, um, you read in a kind of a different genre, looking at, at, at science and social science and applying that to business, but there's, um, business books, there's sort of the two kinds. There's the CEO biographies. Let me more or less explain to you how great I was and how dumb my competitors was. It wasn't luck, it was, you know, I'm sort of paraphrasing a little bit. That's not exactly what they say, but. The second one is, you know, we took a survey and asked successful companies and looked at unsuccessful companies and here's the difference. It, it, that's unsatisfying. Like if you did a survey of a thousand CEOs and looked at total return to shareholders and the ones that were successful drank scotch and the others drank whiskey, does that mean you should drink scotch? So I, I just got 
kind of unsatisfied. I was trying to understand if there's a, a more scientific way, if there's something underlying all that culture stuff. So, so I think that in the course of this, this journey sort of led, led to this book because you ended up writing a book rooted in a business book, but rooted somewhat in physics. And at the core of the idea is this notion of what a loon shot, a loon shot. So how is a loon shot different from a moon shot? We have a sense of what, you know, what companies talk about. Oh, we need a moonshot. We need some big, hairy, audacious goal. But nobody ever, until two weeks ago, has ever talked about loon shots. What the heck is that? Well, if you, if you look back at the course of history, the big ideas, the one that change, that, that change fields of science or transform industries, rarely arrive with blaring trumpets or red carpets, dazzling everybody with their brilliance. They're usually dismissed or neglected for years, sometimes even decades, and their champions are written off as crazy. Um, there wasn't any good word in the English language to capture that, so I made one up. Right, so give us an example of a loon shot. Um, but one example is... Do loon shots become moon shots? Is that your... Well, no, a moon shot is a goal, is a destination. Nurturing loon shots is how we get there. So, for, I mean, for one example, when, when John F. Kennedy declared we're gonna put a man on the moon, that was the original moon shot. But how do we get there? Well, it turns out 30 years earlier, a guy named Robert Goddard had suggested a crazy idea. Well, we're gonna do, you know, explode fuel inside this metal canister and that'll go into space. And people said, you're out of your mind. People ridiculed them, like in front, you know, New York Times. Turns, and it wasn't just for a year or two years, it was 30 years. And of course, that was liquid-fueled jet propulsion. And that's what ended up getting us to the moon. So. Kennedy's goal, his ambition, was the original moonshot, and Goddard's idea was a classic loonshot. Right, and so one of the arguments in your book is that most, some, many organizations don't do enough to foster those loonshots. Loon so what should organizations be doing so that they, they're able to nurture these kinds of things and they're not immediately dismissed as crazy ideas? Right, and it, it starts with a strange puzzle, which is, if we take this, you know, a nice audience here, and if we take any individual person and say, here's this kind of crazy wild idea, what do you, and we talk about the merits of it, they're like, yes, let's go do it. Now you bring all of those same people together into a group and they'll reject it. Question is why? And the, that, if I can take a break and talk about a glass of water. Uh, please do, because I think that's like the key, to me that's the key metaphor. Like I, after reading this book, I will never look at a glass of ice water the same. Talk so let's take this glass of water. So, and imagine it has ice in it, perhaps. Ma imagine. Or not. Or Don't not. imagine Don't that. Imagine. Scrub the memory of the ice cube out of your head immediately. You know, here's, let me do the physics and you do that. <laughs> just, just to do some roll separating here. Um, imagine a glass of water. You can stick your finger in it and swish it around. And that's true for any liquid. The molecules just slosh around. Except, as I gradually adjust the temperature, all of a sudden, they'll completely change behavior. At 32 Fahrenheit, they'll completely change behavior. They'll become totally rigid. The water will freeze into ice. Why? It's exactly the same molecules. There's no CEO molecule with a bullhorn saying, oh, let me check, oh, it's 33, everybody slosh around. Oh, no, wait, 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 no, 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 it's 31, okay, everybody, line up, no, 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 it's back to 30, okay, but they just do it. Why? That's called a collective behavior. And so it was thinking through that and applying that to the collective behavior of people that you see that people will have, they will suddenly transform from embracing wild new ideas to rigidly rejecting them, and it has nothing to do with the individual, just like, no individual molecule is saying, you know, I feel liquid today, let me just run around. <laughs> or I feel rigid, I'm just gonna stay in place. They, it's the same molecule. If you take one molecule and you drop it on a block of ice, what does it do? It freezes. One molecule, you put it in a glass of water, what is it? it sloshes around. So that's how I thought about, I started to think about teams and companies because underlying that, is two forces, a tug of war between two forces. And the same kind of tug of war between two forces that you have in a glass of water, that's the structure underlying the culture, is what happens inside a company. And for too long, people have just talked about the surface, the patterns of behavior, the culture that you see. 
But underlying that is the structure. And structure are the underlying incentives that drive those patterns of behavior. Right. So, so in some level, what you're doing is, you know, so a lot of, you know, along with the business books about empowerment, there's a whole shelf full of business books about culture. And there's a line, probably you might have used it even at McKinsey, where in sort of business thinking, uh, culture eats strategy for lunch. But I think what, what you're saying is, is that structure eats culture for dinner. That's right. Exactly right. So I'll give you an example. Tell us what that means. I'll give you an example. Tell us what that cryptic coin means. I, I get, so culture is a pattern of behavior that you see on the surface. Now, structure is what may be driving that culture. Culture is very hard to change. Structure is actually very easy to change. That's why it's so important. And I'll give you an example. Suppose you organize people into a group and you create, all, when you organize people into a group, you create two forces, one, two, two things that tug at people. One is the stake and outcome. Let's say you're a small biotech company and you want to develop a new cancer drug, you have an enormous stake and outcome. It works, everybody's a hero and a millionaire, it fails, everyone's unemployed. Now let's say you're at Pfizer, just to make up a name, totally at random, <laughs> hypothetical company, just, you know, for any lawyers in the room, I don't know, it's just no relation. <laughs> now you have many more people. You can't manage them like you do with 10 people with one team cap. You need layers. You need a vice president, a senior vice president, maybe an executive vice president. So now you have a second incentive, and that is perks of rent. Those two things are in conflict. And as you change structure, you change how you reward people, you'll start to favor one over the other. So. For example, if you compensate people based on rank, you're going to get a big bonus, you're going to get a big bump in salary when you go up. What are people going to do? Their, their motivation is going to be to fight up that ladder. And how do you fight up the ladder? Well, you stab the other guy. In the, one thing you do is you stab the other guy. In the, you might have some innovative idea. You might have some terrific idea. I said, that's a great idea, Dan. Then I go talk to the boss. You know, Dan didn't really want to say, I didn't want to say in front of anybody else, but listen, let me tell you about all the flaws in his idea. Why? Because you want the next job up. Perks of rank become more important. So what happens is collectively everybody, I might like your idea and you might like my idea, but our incentives are perks of rank, so we shoot down our ideas. So that's the structure. If you reward rank, you're creating a political culture. If you reward people based on their nurturing of their crazy ideas, you create an innovative culture. It sounds like these are two different cultures, and they are two different cultures, but what makes it so different is the underlying structure. Culture is hard to change. Putting people in a room and playing videos and singing kumbaya and hold hands is not very effective. I don't know if you've ever done that in a business situation, but it just doesn't work very well. But businesses keep trying to do motivational stuff like that, but changing culture is much easier. Ordering these molecules to be rigid or be fluid is the equivalent of trying to change culture. So, so, the, so the idea is that in, in one structure of an organization, you're gonna, it's going to be amenable to loon shots. In another structure, it is going to be resistant to it. That's right. So one of them is going to be the, the molecules which will remain the same because the people remain the same. Exactly. They're going to run around and do and, and foster loon shots and other ones are going to sort of be rigid in place and concerned about rank. So give us, bring, this, bring this to a specific example. So what, give us a sense of an organization or a, a, any kind of institution that has battled this and how, and, and how right. that and came out. And the reason that it's so exciting and kind of fun and interesting to think about this is that Changing culture is like changing temperatures. Those small, you don't have to order each molecule to go do stuff. You just change the temperature and they'll all change. So for one example, what encourages a political culture? Well, if your boss is making your dis decisions on who gets promoted, let's say your boss has 10 direct reports and a new spot opens up to be her peer. Let's say she's a vice president and she has 10 associates and she is the one who's choosing who's going to be promoted. Well, what are those 10 associates going to be doing all year long? They're going to be you know, subtly fighting each other for who gets that slot. Now suppose you do something kind of radical, which is done at Google, it is done at McKinsey, it's done at a, a bunch of kind of forward-thinking companies. You take those decisions away from the manager. 
The manager just focuses on the strategy and taking care of employees, but the promotion decisions, someone independent comes in, does an interview process, asks the manager her opinion, asks the other associates, that's clients, customers. You actually take the manager out of the equation. Then what, what are those 10 employees going to, those 10 associates going to do? It's pointless to be lobbying her all year round instead. Why? Because when the interview person comes in to make that call, they're just going to say that person's a dick and they're not going to get promoted. So you don't do the lobbying, you don't do the politics. So that's just one example of, a, of how you think about structure versus culture. Yeah, and, but in terms of this, this, this structure, there, there have been successful loon shots, obviously. What are the conditions that foster that? Like, what do leaders do to foster loon shots? All right, so then one of the most important things you need to do is separate your artists and your soldiers. Okay, so that's a big idea in this book. So artists and soldiers. Tell us who are the artists, who are the soldiers? All right, so the artists are whether they are creative designers or they're scientists or they're people design, inventing new products. They have different motivation, different language. They want to take as much risk as possible. The soldiers are the ones that take a new idea and turn it into products that you deliver on time, on budget, on spec to customers consistently. Those are two very different jobs. Here's the reason you need to separate them. They speak different languages. Here's what I mean by that. The English word risk, it's one word. It's four letters. Now, to a soldier, risk is a really bad thing. If you're going on a battlefield, you don't want a lot of risk. So in fact, a commander might say, you've really de-risked this battle, and that's an awesome thing. Boom. If you're manufacturing tanks or guns, you've really de-risked this process. Now imagine going to an artist and saying, wow, you've really taken all the risk out of your art. <laughs> that's a complete, it's the opposite. So it's totally different. You don't want to tell a soldier, you know, for an artist, you say, or a scientist, or a, someone who's inventing something, you say, try, try 10 different things, 20 different things, see you know, which, which eight of those 10 things are good. Mm -hmm. You don't tell someone who's manufacturing planes, here's, here's what you need to do, let's fly 10 planes into the sky and see which eight crash. We'll keep the two good ones. <laughs> totally, you need to separate your artists and your soldiers, and that's kind of step one. Now, when you say separate, do you mean physically? Tell me what the, the, the specifics are. Is it, is it physical separation? Is it literally different offices? Is it different um, ways of leading those kinds of people? Give us a more specific. It, it's all of the above. So if you if you're lucky enough, then we'll, we'll come back to what to do if you're a solo person and you can't separate yourself in <laughs> space, at least not yet. Um, but if you're a large enough company, yeah, you can create separate roles. The, you know, creating a you know a separate building is sort of almost a cliche. That's the least the interesting things. There, there are two other things you have to get right. You have to separate your artists and soldiers, which includes creating completely different systems, because one, you want as much risk as possible. The other, you want as low risk as possible. You have to get two completely separate systems. But the second thing, and a lot of people do that, but the second thing, which is where most teams and companies or any kind of group fail, is in the transfer. Because so many the problem with real innovation, creating new ideas in teams, companies, or groups, is not the supply of new ideas. The ideas, in many ways, are cheap. You can have tons of ideas or a lot of creative people. If you know how to motivate them and surface the good ideas, it's not that hard. Innovation fails in the transfer. So you need to manage the transfer, not the technology. And it gives you a, if you're a manager or a leader, it gives you a different way of thinking about your job. Your job is not to be a Moses standing on the top of a mountain and saying, all right, I'm anointing the holy loon shot. This is the chosen project this year. Let's part the, part the seas and make way. All you soldiers just do what I say. That doesn't work. It's, it's from the top. You need to manage the touch and balance between these two groups because that's the key. No one else can be in charge of the transfer. You can. Artists are doing their job. Soldiers are doing their job. If you're a manager or a leader, your job is the transfer, and that's where most things fail. Not just one way, get the baby ideas out, not too early, not too late, so then, but the way back, because most ideas fail, and if you don't get the feedback from the field to the artist, it'll just die. Give us an example of a case where either this went right or went wrong. Well, I, uh, I'm kind of a fan of World War II history, and one of the examples, one of the, the technologies that made 
an enormous difference in winning the course of World War II is radar, microwave radar. And that's because the US, the Allies, two or three or four years into the war were being killed by U-boats. And this may or may not be uh, familiar to many of you, but U-boats were strangling the Atlantic for the first few years of the war. And by the fourth year of the war, by early 1943, England was running out of oil. They had three months left of oil. And the U-boats were shooting down ships in the Atlantic. America was trying to resupply Europe. It was shooting down ships in the Atlantic faster than the Allies could build them. And that was because of the U-boat problem. What turned the course of the war was a technology called microwave radar, which allowed planes to see. So you would think, you know, in the classic sort of revisionist history, as soon as the scientists invent microwave radar, you're done. Oh, great. You do a little test. There's a bunch of guys in a building in Boston. Look in Boston Harbor. We can see the U-boat. No. The first time they said, we, saw, we have radar, the pilots were like, eh, I don't want a new technology. Which is like all soldiers everywhere. For, they're familiar with their stuff. It works. They're busy. The first thing will never work. They're going to have to figure it out. They're going to have to talk to those crazy scientists who are all just a bunch of kooks, and they don't want to deal with it. So Vannevar Bush, who was in charge of that, led more like a gardener and less like a monist. He managed the transfer. So he worked with them to get the, science, to get the pilots to try it out. And they did. Nothing happened for almost a year. So finally, he said the problem was the transfer the other way. So he got the scientists, the crazy artists, to get in the cockpits with the pilots. And they discovered when they were flying over the Atlantic or when they were flying over battlefields, the pilots, when they were being shot at, flying hundreds of miles an hour, they didn't want to deal with the, you know, 13 switches on these crazy new the boxes worked, but there were so many switches that we, you know, they just didn't have time to figure it out. They realized the technology was great, the user interface was lousy. They went back, identified this, uh, created this display that you see in movies with the oscilloscope and the sweeping line, put it in the planes, planes went out, Within 30 days, Nazi Germany lost one third of their U-boat fleet. Two months later, the German admiral sent a message to all the U-boats in the Atlantic. Withdraw, the battle has been lost. The lanes were cleared to resupply England. The lanes were cleared for an allied invasion of Europe. So that's how managing the transfer is so important. You need to be a gardener, not a Moses. Right, so, so you need to set up the loon shots. You need to have, in a business sense, your, your soldiers are, are actually delivering the profits from franchises that you've already established. And you've got to make sure that there is, they're, they're separated, but there's a channel of communication between them. Now, you also write about different types of loon shots. Some of them are more about strategy. Some of them are more about products. Tell us about that and why it matters. This, it, that matters enormously, especially today, because there are these two types of, there's a, a pro, and I'll explain what I mean by those. There's a, a product that everybody says will never work, whether that was the telephone where people said, oh, it doesn't work, even if it does, it's just going to be a toy, or the transistor. You could never make a switch out of solid state devices, or personal computers, or digital. Those are all products that people said could never work. Small shifts in strategy are subtle changes in how you deliver stuff to customer that have no new technology. I'll give you an example. Sam Walton, when he was a young kid and wanted to open a retail store, said, oh, I want to do it where people are, which is big cities. So of course I'm going to open it. It turns out his wife didn't like big cities and said, oh, you know what, Sam, honey, I'll support your dream, but I'm not going to live in a town with more than 10,000 people. So he liked being married. He also liked quail hunting. And he discovered there was one region in the country where there are these four states that are, you know, meet at a point and they have four different quail seasons. So he said, let me go there because then I can hunt quail all year round and I'll still be married. Win-win. <laughs> Bentonville, Arkansas. That's where he opened his store. No new technology. He just moved to a slightly different place, sold stuff a little bit cheaper, boom, wiped out the entire industry. That was an S-type loon shot, no technology. So. The problem is that most people have a blind spot to one or the other. Especially today, in, in our culture today, we worship products. Product, 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 all these product innovators, and we miss the subtle shifts in strategy. 
And I'll, I'll give you an example. How many of you remember when IBM was the dominant computer company in the world? They were, you know, probably they were, the industry was called IBM and the Seven Dwarfs. It was so much bigger than any other computer company. And what happened to them? They're not even players in that, in that computer business now. What happened to them? They had a blind spot. What was their blind spot? They saw themselves as a product company, and that was true for 30 or 40 or 50 years. People think the personal computer took out IBM, not what happened. IBM was the dominant product company, and they thought what we do is we make products and people buy our products. Hey, personal computer is another product, let's do it. And they went all in on personal computers, and they were a little bit after Apple, and a little bit after Commodore, and Tiara, and Radio Shack. And they ate their lunch. They went to number one, they had you know, a billion, in, uh, sorry, five billion in sales in their first three years. They were the dominant personal computer company. What happened? They missed a subtle shift in strategy. They missed what customers cared about. So in the course of building this product, Play, play that a little bit more, yeah. In course of building this product, they said, well, you know, everybody buys IBM brand because we're IBM, we make the best products. Here's another product, buy this stuff. In the course of building that computer, they said, you know, the, the stuff on the inside doesn't matter. A little stuff like, oh, I don't know, the operating system. Let's outsource that to, at the time, a 32-person company in Seattle called Microsoft. And, uh, you know, the other components, the thing called a microprocessor, that also doesn't matter. What matters is the product and our brand, because that's what people want, the product. So let's out, we're going to outsource that to a little uh, chip maker company that's kind of struggling financially in Silicon Valley called Intel. Fast forward, what they didn't realize is that customers didn't care about the brand. They just wanted to send emails to their friends. They wanted to send, take pictures and ch exchange. And for that, the brand of the box doesn't matter. What matters is standards. Stuff like software or microprocessor. Today, the combined market value of Microsoft and Intel is well over one and a half trillion dollars. IBM is not even a tenth of that. So that's what happens when you miss your blind spot. So how many of you here work for an organization with say more than 100 employees? Okay, and how many of you, anybody here work for an organization with more than 500 employees? Okay, a lot of you. So let's talk about the folks at, at the, you know, sort of a larger enterprise. What is a lesson from the book about how to be effective as a leader in a large organization? There are three things you need to do. One, you need to set, by the way, since I don't have a very good memory, I remember it visually. I remember it as an ice cube, a garden hoe, and a heart. Okay. Ice cube, separate your artists and your soldiers. Those are different jobs, different languages, right. you need different systems, ice and water. Number two, be a gardener, not a Moses. You gotta manage the transfer. Number three may actually be the most important in many ways, and it's not talked about as much, and it's, it's so frustrating, and people get this so wrong. And number three, I mean, love your artists and soldiers equally. I'll give you an example. A friend of mine is at a, a well-known magazine and is putting out a, is in charge of putting out an issue every 30 days. And she was complaining to me the other day, she said, the senior management is just always in love with whoever's squeaking the loudest about the, you know, the latest shiny penny in it. Oh, there's this podcast we could do with this partnership, blah, 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 blah. And pays no attention to the people who are doing 95% of the work of putting out a magazine every day. So how does it make those people feel? Like crap, taken for granted. And they're like, why are all these just random little scoopers getting all the attention from the CEOs? What you find is the truly great leaders have learned to balance and appreciate because you need both. Just having an idea is getting the ball from your, your goal to your five yard line. The next 95 yards down the field is about turning that idea into a product, about delivering that product, doing it on time, doing it on budget. You need the soldiers for that, you need the artists for that, and they both have to be appreciated. Now let's go, so for the, what about for the many folks here who are at Betaworks, they're building a company, so they're at the, this very um, uh, embryonic stage. What are some lessons for people with those smaller enterprises? So if you're, and you and I are also in, in a sense of one person companies, right. when you're writers or you're an entrepreneur, so if you're, if you're 
team or your company or you are too small to split into separate physical roles and physical places, you need to separate not by role, but by time. So here's what I mean by that. You want to put on, just carve out a period, let's say a week, let's say you're just five people or 10 people. Carve out a week, take off your execution hat, on time, on budget, rigid rules, discipline, metric. Say we, for one week, are just going to be insane artists. We're going to speed dial every possible crazy idea, what's going on in the market. We're going to interview people about what's the dumbest, craziest idea you've heard in our field. We're going to interview customers, clients, ourselves, our competitors. What are the crazy, and just write them down and just think about it. And at the end, we might pick the top three or four of those to work on. But when the week is over, you take off your artist hat, you put back on your soldier, and you say, all right, back to work. Now it's time for the soldiers. We need to take the top whatever we've decided, turn that into a product, deliver that on like time that, budget. Yeah, yeah, artist time, soldier time. Exactly. Um, and then hammer time. Um, <laughs> the, um, the, um, that was painful. Let's go. Let's let's go out to some questions. Who has questions for Safi about any of this what we've been talking about? Do we have and we have microphones to run in there? And then we also have, I know we've already had some questions come in via Facebook. So, um, so yes, go ahead, please. So um, there's particularly in the investment community, there's often this phrase patient capital, particularly around things that, are, that might have a social impact and the absence of a sufficient patient capital. One of the things that came to mind as you were talking about loon shots was, and even the use case of somebody inventing something 30 years and then it's sort of taking 30 years to be, I mean, our organizations, I haven't seen it, that a lot of organizations are patient enough to do the truly loon shot kind of thinking. What is envisioned as truly innovative is more window dressing. I, you know, I think you're absolutely right, not to keep going back to World War II, but that idea that turned the course of the war radar, the usual history is, oh, it was sort of discovered in England in the mid-1930s. Turns out two scientists in a lab had discovered the same principles 10 years earlier. It could have shortened the war, it could have saved a lot of lives, but what happened? They were rejected by people in this large organization, not poorly intentioned people, but they said, well, that'll never, you know, it'll take more than, a, you know, 18 months to play out, so let's not do it. So, fast forward, I think the better organizations have learned this lesson. I'll give you an example which, as I was doing some of the research for this book, kind of surprised me, which is uh, Microsoft. I got to know some of the people in, the, um, in their research group. And when Satya Nadella took over, they did have a research group which worked on some far out ideas, but one of the things he said, he took one of the leaders in the group and said, I think your ideas may not be crazy enough. So I want you to break off of the crazy idea group and work on the crazy ideas that are too crazy for the crazy idea groups, the crazy, crazy idea groups, the crazy squared ideas. And that's what they're doing today. So I think if the better or forward thinking companies do this, they separate their artists you know, they're soldiers, in that case they're artists, and then they're really, really, really crazy artists into different groups and give them different homes and nurture them because that's the only way you can have sustainable growth. But let me come back to that for a second. So you have that particular situation that you're facing, that you have a, you're, lo you're looking for patient capital or your capital is being impatient. So tell me, tell me what, tell, tell us, tell us, tell me your first name, by the way. Maria? Yeah. So Maria, so tell us a little bit more about that. Maybe we can get, he's a former McKinsey consultant and, and this is free McKinsey advice. So. Seriously, why are you? <laughs> so, so, Stop with that thing. So, so, um, so, so what you have is you have investors who want to see action right away. So they might be sort of um, uh, philosophically inclined toward loon shots and they love crazy ideas, but they want to see results sooner rather than later. Yeah. It, well, I think I'm looking at it from, I have a concept that's a little bit crazy, uh -huh. that I'm trying to balance between sort of the reality of my life of you know, working on right. helping organizations become more innovative through work that I do. Right. And I just see the tension between the drumbeat of um, results and OKRs yeah. and shareholder returns right. And, right. and hockey sticks and all yeah. this sort of metric driven mania, which is incredibly powerful. I work on data stuff, but 
the art, the things that would take difficult challenges, I'm looking at a concept around how would you take the change in the way in which we use cash and the massive issues around access to cap, um, homelessness and mm -hmm. those who are not, and how would you leverage the urge to give and turn that into a vehicle for savings? Interesting. And I, as one of the concepts that I'm thinking about, and the business case on that, it's a mess, right? It, yeah. it, there's, there is definitely something in there, but how do you frame that in a way that's going to be acceptable to the degree of certainty that most are trying to eke out of, out yeah. of yeah. Any guidance on that? Sure. So the um, one thing you want to try to help managers or leaders of company understand is you nurture loan shots to challenge beliefs. The things that you are sure are absolutely true, my, and this happens so much if you're a manager or a leader, somebody comes to you with a crazy idea and you say, there's no way that could work because you know, I've been in this field at, you know, 5, 10, 15, 20, 30, my entire life. It just doesn't work that way. Those leaders often end up dead. And the reason you want to have a small group of people nurturing the things that you are sure are true but maybe they aren't, is because how do you want to discover that you're wrong? Do you want to discover it by opening a press release and reading that your competitor has just proved that right and you have no business? Or do you want somebody in your organization, you know, some young person coming up to you and saying, I think this crazy idea is getting some traction. How do you want to discover a loon shot? Do you want to discover it like a bullet coming to your head? Or do you want to discover it internally before any of your competitors and turn that into a bullet going towards them? So that's why you nurture loon shots inside. Other questions? Uh, right over there. We have a microphone over there, please. Uh, here? Yeah. <laughs> Hi, Safi. So first of all, congratulations on the book. We, we bow and genuflect with awe and admiration. Um, you can stop. OK, next question. <laughs> So, uh, let me ask an unfair and somewhat unanswerable question. There is a degree Definitely to which next question. everything <laughs> that one has to do to do a book like this is you look back at what has worked and you try to find patterns that are similar and tease out lessons and observations that can be useful to apply to the present and the future. But it, in a weird thought experiment way, if you were to take some of the aspects of loon shots, which would be what do people do when they're trying to do things that haven't been done, you could potentially read your book and, and then d distill the lesson of one should do nothing that you say other people have done in the past that's worked because it's not entirely clear that whatever has worked in the past will continue to work in the future. How do you, how do you grapple with that in the sense of the copying of past patterns is a very soldierish thing to do. And so what, what do you do with that conundrum? wrapped in an enigma surrounded by a mystery. <laughs> Next question, no. Uh, th there are two things there. One is, I wish, if, if, we, if I could have one wish, it's that the phrase disruptive innovation would be cut out of the dictionary. Because I think it, it, it goes to what Zach was just saying, which is, if you just focus on what some guru with a PowerPoint is telling you is going to be the future and is going to transform your market, you will take your eyes off the ball of the small little changes to your main business that your competitors happen to be working on. I mean, I'll give you an example, Pan Am. So Pan Am was focused on jet engines and building bigger, faster, these crazy new things. Its competitors were working on subtle, not very glamorous things like hub and spoke, you know, fly into a hub airport, you know, develop a hub and spoke, make more, become more faster turnaround times. Not, nothing very glamorous. But when airline deregulation hit, Pan Am was dead. It had these giant planes and high fuel costs around that time, and it was gone. Its competitors, who had been innovating around the small changes that no one said would be disruptive, actually did very well. So the first thing you want to do is you want to nurture those loon shots to challenge belief, the crazy ones that are really out there, but without taking, that doesn't mean that you're, take your eyes off your ball, uh, take the eyes off 
the ball of the main products you're working on and the small little adjustments to those main products. You have to do both. You have to nurture both of those things in order to succeed. And don't worry about market potential. So many times, when Sam Walton, I mentioned the Sam Walton story, when he moved and started a little store, was he saying, here's what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna disrupt the retail industry. No, he just wanted to stay married and hunt quail. So, you, when, when the scientists who first developed the transistor, they said, we're gonna revolutionize electronic communication. No, the scientists who were working on that transistor were trying to build better switches, and when they first built the transistor, it was so unreliable and expensive, no one could figure out what to do with it. It was actually useless in communication. It took five years to figure out the first application, which was hearing aids. Couldn't put a vacuum tube in a hearing aid. So did the scientists in 1945 and 6 and someone when they were working on this project say, I got a great idea, boss, let's disrupt the hearing aid market? No. You nurture loon shots to challenge beliefs, don't worry about market potential, and don't take your eyes off the ball about your main business. Let's go to the next one. Back here, please. Yeah, so you, you talk a lot about um, kind of structure here. Through your experience in writing, have you found any kind of limiting factors to that where structure was kind of counterproductive to innovation or success in a company? Like, have you found situations where this is too much structure or, or we're not providing a lot, enough flexibility within the organization for people to kind of flow between artistry and, and other things, right? Yeah, I mean, you, you want to be careful about using them. By, by the word structure, I don't mean create rigid rules. By the word structure, I just mean what are the equivalents of the changes in organization design? So by structure, I mean we want a very loose system when we're nurturing creative ideas and a much more rigid quality control system when we're trying to build things to low risk. So by structure, I mean separate those two things. And where it goes wrong is if people misapply. When you try to put six, six sigma, how many people have heard of six sigma or other sort of quality control management kind of trends or fads? Sure, if you're trying to reduce error rates in manufacturing, that's a good metric. But if you say six sigma, you know, it's 3.49 p.m., I've only had 3.2 ideas from you today, I need another 1.7 by five, or you're gonna be four sigma, not six, that just doesn't work. You can't schedule. So that's misapplying structure. Uh, let's go back here, please. Hi, uh, thank you for the talk. I haven't read your book yet, but I will, I promise. Um, so as you were talking about the concept of separating artists and soldiers, it struck me as incredibly familiar. You're like every single day of my life familiar because I'm a writer and you're both writers. And so I'm curious how that process happens in your head because you know, the writing process is kind of like what you're describing, where you got to be the artist and just kind of vomit on the page, but then <laughs> at some point, the soldier's got to show up and tidy it up and turn it into something recognizable, presentable. So I'm just curious if you've thought about that, that aspect of it and that's what a, your experience of it was. No, it's a great question. It's, a, it's in some ways where I got the metaphor for if you're just a solo practitioner, and I'll turn over to Dan to, to answer, but it's wearing different hats. So when you're in creating mode, you're in artist mode, you just have to speed. Creating is about, and creativity for me is three things. It's speed, attention, and courage. You just gotta speed for you know, searching for ideas, you gotta pay attention when you see a tiny little thing that doesn't fit, oh, that's the way in, that's something, you have the courage to follow it. So that's the artist that when you're just trying to create, create some really wacky, crazy idea stuff. Then you have to take off that hat and edit. If you confuse those two things, you'll get nowhere. Because if you try to create really fast, I always think about it, in, when I'm in my artist hat, I think about it as write FBR. Write fast, bad, and wrong. Be because if you, one person got it maybe. <laughs> Never mind. But I think of it like that because if you, and I did this when I first started, is if you, write a sentence and like say, you know, in 1937, and then you're, oh wait, was that 37? Let me go on Google or Wikipedia, it might have been 35, and then it was April, and then you get curious about what happened in May, you know? <laughs> then you're like, you've written four words, and now you're like 57 minutes into hunting through Wikipedia and Google, and nothing happens. 
So it's like you're driving a car, you just need to go at high speed, and if you accelerate to five miles an hour and then decelerate to two, and then accelerate up to five, you never get faster. So you need to just write, if you have some perfectionist, and you know, I grew up as a scientist, so you want to get facts right. So it's, it was a very difficult effort of will to say, put a, I'm going to write, in 1935, blah, 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 happened, and it, I might be wrong. But I just, in order to get the, into the flow of creating some crazy thing, you have to write as fast as possible. Don't worry about spelling. Don't worry about grammar. Don't worry about writing a sentence and then perfecting it and then writing. That's a disaster. So, separating artist and soldier, it's exactly what we were just talking about. You separate in time. Put on your, I literally have a physical hat. Put on your artist hat. Do, do you, seriously, do you really? Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> It's cool. It's like it's it's, it's a set, essentially a different identity. So why not actually show that? I, think I saw a little. That's interesting. <laughs> okay, got it. Maybe I shouldn't have said that out loud. Anyway, it's inner voice. Yes, you you really coach yourself into whether you know writing is one example. If you're an actual artist, same thing. You got to make your art, but then you know what? You actually have to sell it. And if you do a crappy job on that, you're kind of going nowhere. So you need to have all these crazy ideas that you uh, put down the page, but then you need to stop then before you send it out. Let's do go back carefully. And that's a totally different mode, and it's completely the opposite and counterproductive to creation. You need to separate them in time. And if you confuse that, you'll get nowhere. What, what, what kind of writer are you? What, what kind of writing do you do? Thank you. So, yeah, it's just a crazy process of kind of meditating and going back and digging through memories. And how do you arrange things now? Um, I try my best to do what Safi just said. Right. Uh, but I do get stuck in that thing like, wait, was that, was that in 1986 or whatever? And um, so you... I was just curious how, how the process was for you in writing this book specifically. And then... On top of that, which is which I was thinking about, was just after you're done, you've done the whole artist and soldiers thing, and now you become the artist handing it over to the soldiers in the publishing industry, giving it over and having that whole thing. I was just curious how that works for you. Well, since my publishers are sitting right there, <laughs> you can hear a, you're gonna hear what, uh, come later two drinks, we'll have another discussion. No, I mean it, that that's not true. In the publishing industry, you really you still have to be both. You know, the publishers have a role, but you've got to do both still. You have to get out there, you have to get the word out, you have to get it done. But in the writing, it's, I'm not just talking about the publishing and marketing, editing. You write your crazy ideas, you write fast, bad, and wrong, you'll get a lot of crazy ideas, but they're wrong. You can't put that out, you have to put on your soldier hat, clean it up, edit it up, get the facts right, then you're done. So even before you get to the publishing, you need to do both in creating your work. And that's whatever, whether you're running a company. You gotta have some, take time out and brainstorm. If you're just too much soldier, you're just doing the next thing. You're the rat on the treadmill. Da, 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 da. Let's do this milestone, let's do that milestone. And it, you know what, it, psychologically, it is a very stressful thing to be an entrepreneur. And you fill your calendar with these little milestones because then you feel like you're getting done. But you need to take a break. Execution, operations, get that done. Put on a different hat. If it helps you to create a different hat, it does. Thank you very much. If it helps you to wear a different hat, do it. Because you don't want to be that rat in the treadmill, just going, 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 and then you're gone over a cliff. You want to pause, take a break, whether it's a day or a week, and just say, let's think of all the crazy ideas out there that might kill us. Seriously, from our customers, our suppliers, our partners, what could kill our investors? What could they do that would kill us? And let's just set aside all the operate. How could we be killed? You'd rather discover that in your own room, wouldn't you, with your team members, writing, thinking about it, than with an actual bullet to your head. So take a week, think of, or a day, or a couple of days, and just think about that. Why? Not only might it prevent you from being killed, but you could turn it around. Let's take, a, let's take a few more, yes. We're going to Go actually take a couple questions. Oh, sorry, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Facebook, really yeah. quick. Our, our next Big Idea Club Facebook group is chiming in with a few questions. Um, Deloitte found that pharma 
R&D return on investment has steadily fallen over the past seven years. What percentage of funding would a drug discovery organization need to create a loon shot structure? And maybe more generally, can, is there a way to quantify how much, com, how much, what percentage a uh, company should invest in research and development in order to create a loon shot group that can be productively disruptive? <laughs> what was that? <laughs> so a market analyst on the line. Yeah. Uh, Cost, pharma R&D is suffering. Cost to develop a new drug, there are a couple of factors going on. One is that the, it's just, the drug discovery industry has a vicious cycle of success, which means the more patients do well, the longer, let's say, they live, or the longer they are healthy, the harder it is to run a clinical trial, because you just have to wait longer and longer to see symptoms, which means the costs grow exponentially. So, it's great that we're developing new drugs, That's a wonderful benefit to society. They go off patent and then they're essentially free uh, You know, after the first 10 years or so. The vicious cycle is that it then becomes harder to find the next drug because you just have to clear a higher, higher hurdle. So part of the problem with drug discovery becoming more expensive is this weird vicious cycle of the hurdle getting high, the bar getting higher and higher all the time. But a second part of the problem is this counterintuitive surprising thing, which we're just starting to get over. Science. We've developed all these new tools, like the Human Genome Project, which gives us a new way to quantify the science of a drug. Now the truth of drug, most drugs were discovered by trial and error, it's a lot of serendipity. And what happened about 20 years ago with the Human Genome Project is you created a whole new language for analysis. And what happens is you buried a lot of drugs with analysis. before. Before you had that tool, it's kind of intuitive because you would think, oh, that would help you. But what happened is it gave managers a whole new language for CYA, meaning cover your rear end. Meaning somebody comes with you an idea. Now that you have this tool, you say, well, did you do that thing with the tool? Did you do this other thing with it? No, I didn't, so go back and do it. So now you spend years. So this weird fact is that the Human Genome Project, which sounded like a great thing, created a new language for covering your rear end. And I think people have only started to figure out that the pendulum swung too far to rigidity and proving things out before you ever try, and we need to bake in a little serendipity. And so the managers who have learned to engineer serendipity, meaning create a balanced environment between science and engineering, those are the ones that are doing the best. Michael, do we have more from Facebook? How about one more? Yeah. Uh, do you believe loon shots can work in nonprofit organizations? If so, how might that look, as most of the examples you give are from for-profit companies or government-run agencies? That's a great, I just spent a full day with uh, Conservation International, which is a nonprofit that has a, uh, you know, a terrific mission and is doing terrific things, and they really wanted to understand how to nurture loon shots better to save the planet, to help climate. And so, any group, whether they're for-profit or non-profit, is going to, have to think about the collective effects of nurturing loon shots in a group. You need to separate your artists and soldiers. Even if you're at a nonprofit, let's say you're fighting, fighting climate change and someone comes up with a crazy idea that just sounds nuts that everybody dismisses, the temptation is just to poke fun at it. But how do you, if you're managing or leading or inside one of those nonprofit groups, how do you create an environment that nurtures those crazy ideas, even if they're non profit they're for saving the planet, how do you create an environment that nurtures those crazy ideas and challenges the accepted wisdom on climate change and what might work? Let's take uh, one or two more before we wrap up. Yes, over here, please. Hi, uh, I found your third idea, uh, which you said was very um, important, really refreshing, which is to treat um, the the creatives and the, uh, the artists and the soldiers equally, which I don't see very often, especially in certain industries like the media industry, the, the fashion industry, where you know the people supposedly with the big ideas are like God, and they're irreplaceable, and the foot soldiers, they're considered mundane and replaceable, mm -hmm. and they're not treated the same, which usually leads to low morale uh, in the, in the you know, company or institution. So how do you talk to those leaders and to address them, to address this issue by ex 
you know, reminding them that the foot soldiers in their eyes are actually playing equally important part and deserve uh, to treat it well. And um, also closely related to that is once you separate, uh, you know, these two caste, uh, not caste, the two category of, of people, even though you claim that you treat them uh, equally, the food soldiers might consider themselves to be creative people too, and they want their ideas to be recognized. How do you fend off, you know, the potential resentment from this camp? All right. Well, you can start with a story that, in, in doing some of the research for this book, I, I'll tell this story, even though it's about a very famous person that we all think we knew, because what I thought I knew about it, and what I think a lot of people think. It's not really what happened and it illustrates exactly what you're talking about. And that's the case of Steve Jobs, who was held as, hailed as this wild product innovator, crazy art. And when he was young, in his first time at Apple, when he was in his 20s and up until he was about 30 years old, he saw himself and he kept arguing with pride, I am an artist. And when he was working on this new project called the Macintosh, he said, we're all artists. And Everybody else is the Navy. We're the pirates and the artists and the creatives. And you guys, literally, you guys suck. And called them bozos. And they actually, that was 95% of the company that was generating 95% of the revenue. And they took to wearing buttons with Bozo the Clown with a red line. We're not bozos. What happened? The morale was terrible. People started leaving on the franchise side, the Apple III. The people who were working on the Apple III, like Wozniak, were doing really creative things for the Apple III, and they left. And the people on the Mac side that Jobs was leading, it was such a dysfunctional, you know, the, 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 the road between those two buildings was called the demilitarized zone, the DMZ, because there was so much hostility. Just like you say, they created this, it was incredibly dysfunctional. So what happened? When the Mac launched, it was a flop. Great advertising with the Super Bowl commercial, but it, you know, it overheated, it was too slow, it was not usable, and people didn't use it. It was a complete flop. And the franchises flopped. Apple was a disaster at that time. Fast forward 12 years later, Steve Jobs came back, and what happened? His, on the one hand, Johnny Ive, one of the legendary great product designer artists of all time. On the other hand, Tim Cook, who was called the Attila the Hun of inventory at his previous job. <laughs> kind of the ultimate artist and the ultimate soldier. And people say, oh, Jobs was this great artist. What he really learned, the, the truth behind the story is that he learned to balance his artists and soldiers equally. And who, who took over when Steve Jobs died? The soldier. And when he was interviewed, when he was interviewed in the last year or two of his life, he told his biographer who asked him, you know, what's your ultimate accomplishment? He said, I think, Jobs said, I think my greatest innovation may be in how I design my organization. Let's take one more. Sorry, yeah, the last one here. It's kind of similar to your question, actually. If the creatives are totally separate from the soldiers, how are the creatives kind of seeing the day-to-day -day problems that the soldiers are running into and kind of addressing those issues if there's so much separation? I mean, you're talking about the radar people having to fly in the planes and really understand like, oh, this is why they're not utilizing it. How do they, how do you kind of bridge that gap? That's, exa that's exactly the biggest failure point in innovation. Creatives can come up with a ton of ideas, but what you just said is the biggest failure point because they don't see what happens in the field. And when they don't see what happens in the, every product, everything in the beginning sucks. Every, uh, Hemingway used to say every first draft is shit. <laughs> It's true in writing, it's true in product design, but if you don't get that feedback, that product will just die because the marketers, the manufacturers, they just won't make it anymore. So that's the point you have to manage, the transfer between the two. You have to find ways, you have to incentivize the soldiers, the marketers, to actually collect that feedback. And that was a failure point of so many companies because people thought soldiers would just naturally do it on their own. But let's say you're out marketing some new product. I'll give you an example, famous example, another classic case, Xerox Park, which gets the history, often is told very wrong in the histories. They invented the graphical user interface, the laser printer, the ethernet, and they just stood back and thought the marketers would market it. Never happened. Why the marketers were selling typewriters? 
They were on commission for typewriters. It's not that they were bad people and didn't like those new toys. They're like, I got a mortgage. I can sell a typewriter in five minutes. I know how it works. My customer, your new thing is cool, but it's gonna flop. I had to spend two weeks, three weeks learning it, blah, blah, blah. They just didn't put in place the right incentive. You have to figure out the underlying structure so that the two will cooperate. Okay, Safi, one last question for you. So, so imagine somebody reading this book, okay? Somebody's read this book, they've turned the last page, they've turned the cover. At that moment, what do you want them, what's one thing you want them to do as a consequence of reading the book? I hope they're gonna walk away, well, firstly, entertained, but secondly, uplifted and optimistic, realizing that all these great discoveries that you hear about, whether it was Steve Jobs, who, you know, you sort of read about, oh, he's this great product genius. Actually, he was ridiculed for almost a decade. And so many more of these incredible breakthrough discoveries. So, don't give up. All the people that you read about today with revisionist histories, they were ridiculed or dismissed, not for a week, not for a month, but sometimes for years. So number one, don't give up. And number two, remember this, there are no experts of the future. <laughs>